Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spillman, and this week we're starting a new series on Jeremiah the prophet. And our first lesson is entitled, The Calling of the Prophet, or uh, The Prophetic Calling of Jeremiah. Uh, before we begin anything, we're just going to start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us as we study your word. Help us, Lord, to understand uh, from the words of the prophets what we can apply to our lives today. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. So before we officially get started, uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about how you can participate in tonight's program. There's a few ways that you can do that. The first way is by webcam. So if you're on uh, with the Uvu software installed in your computer, uh, you can connect to our Bible study conference through uh, your webcam and we'll be able to see each other face to face. If you don't have Uvu already installed in your computer, you can go to uvu.com and download it and then add Inspirited Network to your friends list. Once you have the software installed, you just call Inspirited Network uh, when we're broadcasting live like right now. And uh, you'll be able to log into our Bible study conference through the webcam. So you just put one finger up into the air when you're ready to make a comment or ask a question or say anything. And we will put you on screen with us so we can talk face to face. The next option that you have, you don't want to be seen, but you want to be heard, is to call in through our telephone conference line. There's a few ways that you can do that. The first way is by using um, a regular landline or cell phone that you just call the number 712-432-3066. Again, the number is 712-432-3066 then you put in the access code number which is 426101 again the access code number is 426101 anytime you want to ask a question or make a comment you just press five star on your telephone keypad and we will unmute your line just five star on your telephone keypad and we will unmute your line now if you don't have a regular landline or cell phone that can call the US you also have the option to use Skype so if you have a uh, paid Skype account you can actually use Skype to call the same number and put in the same access code and uh, you'll be able to join our study or you can do a free Skype to Skype call and just call the, uh, just call Inspirited2 on Skype and you'll be logged into our telephone conference that way. Um, the next option that you have, if you don't want to be seen and you don't want to be heard, but you still want a way in which you can participate, you can join in through our, uh, any of the broadcasters that we're currently broadcasting on. So right now we're actually on Ustream, uh, old, Make, uh, old Livestream, Make TV, Google Hangouts, YouTube, and a few other platforms. So once you join our study by watching us uh, through, the, through any of those broadcasters, you can type into the text chat and send us messages directly, which we'll get right here in the studio. Um, you have the option to use Facebook to send me a message directly if you want. Just go to John Spellman on Facebook. If you're having trouble finding me, uh, just go to facebook.com forward slash Inspirited Network, and you'll be able to send me messages directly as the program is live, and I'll get them and be able to respond. All right, so uh, those are all the different ways you can participate. And with that said... We are ready to begin tonight's study. Um, so this quarter we're talking about Jeremiah the prophet. And uh, Jeremiah is one of the most well-known prophets in the Bible um, who had a lot to say about uh, ancient Israel and uh, the kingdom of Judah. Um, uh, but during the, the, the time of his life, Jeremiah was not always accepted. Um, but yet God called him to ministry and um, his prophetic message was not popular. But the popularity of his message did not negate the fact that God was with him and, and, and had put his words within Jeremiah's mouth to proclaim this unpopular message. So uh, Jeremiah had a, a very difficult job to um, go and to proclaim to people a message which they did not want to hear. Um, but yet Jeremiah was called by God. So if we go to Jeremiah chapter one and verse five, the Bible says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you before you were born. I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So God had a calling on Jeremiah's life long before Jeremiah was ever born. God had a purpose and a plan for his life, just like he has a plan for you and I. Um, and so when God called him, he revealed to him, hey, I'm the one who's had, who, who's had this plan for you um, since before you were even born. I raised you up for this purpose. Um, so Jeremiah was called as a child, and uh, he felt unworthy, much like many of the other prophets when we read their stories. Anyone who's come into direct contact with God has always had this sense of their own unworthiness. And perhaps it's that sense of unworthiness that makes them more qualified than those who would think that they would be worthy. Um, but nevertheless, Jeremiah was called as a child, and uh, he felt unworthy for this calling. Um, if we take a look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 18, we see how 
God responds to that. So the beginning of his response um, actually happens a few verses earlier. But if you look at verse 18, um, you see here where, where, where it says, For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and, a, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. Verse 19, And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. So here we learn that when God calls a person to do a particular work or to, to accomplish a mission or to be a prophet and to proclaim a prophetic message, um, when God is with a person, he will defend them against uh, all who would raise up opposition against them. So even though Jeremiah felt inadequate, um, God said that he was with him to deliver him, and he would make Jeremiah just like a defense city. So if you think about the analogy that God's using here, or the metaphor rather, um, he's comparing Jeremiah's mission to a defense city that's under attack. Now, if a city was not, uh, was, was not defensed properly, uh, then when another nation or, or, or group of, or body of people came to attack it, they would easily overtake it, ravage everything in the city, perhaps burn it down, and take the things that they want, uh, loot and burn, and then leave. But a defense city um, had, a, uh, ha had things in place so that when another nation came to attack or destroy them, uh, they were able to fend them off and, and, and send them on their way so that the city would not fall uh, to those who were oppressing and attacking it. So when God uses this analogy that he's going to make Jeremiah a defense city, he's talking about the fact that he will defend Jeremiah to such an extent that just like how an army would have to flee before a defense city, not being able to overtake it, so uh, those who would pursue Jeremiah and persecute him uh, would be ineffective because God was defending him. Um, so let's take a look at uh, Jeremiah's uh, response to the prophetic call. We're going to go to, we're going to stay in chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 6. <clears throat> and it says here, Then said I, this is Jeremiah talking, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. So in this verse, in verse 6, we kind of see Jeremiah's sense of being unworthy. He doesn't really feel like he's qualified uh, to go and to proclaim this message before these people. Uh, but God responds to him and, and, and says in verse 7, uh, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put, his, put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. You know, I think that today we can kind of identify with, uh, with Jeremiah and his feelings of, you know, being unworthy to go and to proclaim uh, God's message. <clears throat> because there's a lot entailed, you know, especially when your message is unpopular and you've received the message from God and, and, and it's not what people want to hear. Um, a lot of times you face a lot of opposition from those who don't want to hear that message. And I mean, just even today, you can think about, you know, the, the, the uh, messages that Christians are proclaiming. And, you know, when people put across the truth, a lot of times others just don't want to hear that message. You know, you think about people on the subway, for example, who are preaching the word of God and talking that and tell, telling people that they need to repent of their sins uh, because God is going to judge the world. And because people don't want to hear that message, you know, they, they're like, oh, you know, this is noise pollution. We don't want to hear it. Can't these guys just be quiet? You know, nobody really wants to hear it. Um, and so Jeremiah... I'm sure felt intimidated by the fact that people just would not want to hear this unpopular message that God was going to give to him. Um, and so, you know, he says, I'm a child. I can't speak. I don't, I don't know if I'm the one, if I'm the right person to reach these individuals, but God responds to that by saying, look, I put my words in your mouth. You're going to go to everybody whom I send you to. And I feel that today, uh, God may be putting his word in our mouths and he may call us to preach an unpopular message at a particular time when people won't want to hear it. But if we're called by God to preach that message, then we need to do what God has called us to do. And, he, and here is a promise, not just for Jeremiah, but for us today. God said, you will go, um, you'll, you'll go to all who I will send you. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. And then, of course, the next verse, be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So 
Today, God may be saying to us that he's with us to deliver us, even when we have to preach a message that other people won't want to be, won't want to hear. We should not be afraid of their faces. Yes, people might look at you strange. People might say some, uh, certain things about you. They, may not, they might not want to hear uh, the message that's coming from you. They might do things to, um, to distract or to dis, uh, dissuade you from, from going forward with the, mes- with the message or the mission that God has called you to, but we should not be afraid of their faces and we need to move forward with what God is, uh, with what God is leading us to do. Um, so Jeremiah, yes, he had this unpopular message and because the, of the fact that the message was unpopular, uh, a lot, the various parts of his life would not be happy. Uh, Jeremiah went through suffering. He went through woes. He went through, uh, periods of persecution. Um, he was often rejected. So these things probably made his life very miserable at the time when he was experiencing uh, this rejection. But the question, the first question that I want to throw out to you is, when you think about somebody who is despised, rejected, um, who goes through suffering, who um, goes through woes, who's even in prison uh, for preaching the truth, just as Jeremiah was, who else does that make you think of? So who else in the Bible do we know was despised, rejected, uh, had woes, um, went through suffering, was imprisoned, just like Jeremiah, for preaching the truth, uh, but because they had an unpopular message, they had to go through all these th- all these things. Who does that remind you of? Okay, comment just came in. Jesus and John the Baptist. Yes, um, I was actually thinking particularly about Jesus, because Jesus was someone who was uh, despised and rejected. Uh, and even though he was the revelation of the Father, he came to reveal the Father uh, to humanity. He came to give forgiveness and, and offer uh, opportunity for repentance of sins. Still, people rejected him. Uh, and so Jeremiah, in his life, experienced the sufferings that Jesus would later on in, um, you know, in, in the New Testament go through um, because he preached an unpopular message. Okay, so um, <clears throat> while we're waiting... Uh, Jesus went through many of these sufferings that uh, Jeremiah had gone through in his, in his day. So in a way, Jeremiah functioned like a type of Christ because of the fact that he experienced uh, many of the things that the Messiah would later on uh, experience. And, you know, it's showing us that the people were rejecting uh, God. They, they did not uh, want to hear his message. They uh, rejected it at, at, at every turn. Okay, so uh, the next question that I have is, what is a prophet's job? So we're talking about Jeremiah going through the suffering uh, and through a lot of uh, rejection and and persecution. And then um, we find that Jesus had the same experience. So the next question that I want to throw out to you, what is a prophet's job? Okay. Go for it. The answer, the answer to the first question reminds me uh, the tough times that Jeremiah had to go through. It reminds me of Joseph and Jesus, but Joseph because his brothers, you know, kind of like betrayed him, and then he was sold into prison, and then uh, well, he was sold into sold into house, and then into prison, mm-hmm. and. Um, but I want to bring you back to the Bible, what it says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Mm-hmm. So God had a good purpose in it. And also, today, Pastor Montero, he was falsely accused and put in prison. But he was able, God was with him, and he was able to do Bible studies in prison and be a light for good. And uh, the answer to the, the other question is, uh, who did the, I mean, what is the job of the prophet? Well, I want to bring you back to the Bible real quick, if I can. Um, for Matthew, in Matthew, the chapter 3, verses 11, and it says, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, I am deed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, 
whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so John, that was John the Baptist's mission, and it was to call people to full repentance and to point them to Christ. Amen. Um, I want to take us to Jeremiah chapter 11. And I want to take a look at another dynamic of uh, a prophet's job. So if we go to Jeremiah 11, chap and, uh, sorry, Jeremiah chapter 11 and verse 2, here scripture tells us, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought, brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to, the, according to all which I command you, so shall ye be my people, and I will be your God, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Then answered I and said, So be it, O Lord. Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and do them. So, the next idea is, okay, well, what exactly is this showing us about another aspect of the job of a prophet? I think one of the things is that you see this concept of the covenant and the, uh, the law being stressed here. So, prophets reaffirmed the covenant and uh, the, wor the, the, the word of God, the, God's law. So they often call people to repentance for the breaking of God's law. Um, and so when God has them proclaimed before the people, they were giving warning messages that uh, the covenant had been transgressed and that they were not uh, in, in keeping with God's commandments. If we take a look, for example, <clears throat> at Micah chapter 3 and verse 8, uh, one of the prophets had the job of telling people when they had transgressed the covenant. So let's take a look at Micah 3, 8, which says, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto, unto Jacob his transgression, sorry, his transgression and to Israel his sin. So notice here the prophet says to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So prophets often made known when people had transgressed the covenant, when they had broken the law of God, and when they had thus sinned. Now remember that a person uh, could not sin unless there was a law that they were breaking. Because what is, what is the biblical definition of sin? Well, if we go to uh, the book of 1 John, and chapter uh, 3, verse 4, it says, Whomso Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, when we take that and we look at Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, uh, the Bible says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So the law reveals to us what sin is. All right? So without the law, there's no knowledge of sin. A person couldn't know that they were sinning unless they had a law which told them that they should not do such and such. So sin is the transgression of the law, and the law reveals to the sinner what sin is. Um, when, back in the Garden of Eden and in uh, creation, there was no need, no need for a codified law because everybody naturally did what was contained in the law. Um, you know, they, they naturally obeyed God from the heart. But once sin entered the picture, the law had to be codified and written down because people had forgotten and rejected the law. So the law that now... Um, functions as a, as a warning to show us when we're being disobedient and when we have committed sin. And so a prophet's job is that when people are ignoring the law, when they transgress the law, and when they break the covenant, the prophet reveals the transgression and reveals the sin. So that's one of the, ma the main jobs of a prophet. And what's fascinating is the, fact, is the fact that when you're revealing to people their sins, that's often why their messages are so unpopular. Nobody wants to hear when they're doing something wrong. My next question for you. In what way was Jeremiah's message very similar to the message of others before and after him? Okay, looks like we got a comment that just came in. 
it mentions judgment. Yes, that's true. That's, that is one aspect. I mean, definitely the prophets mention uh, judgment. Uh, are there any other thoughts? What were the similarities between Jeremiah and many of the other prophetic messages that were preached by other prophets, like, you know, Jeremiah, or sorry, like uh, Isaiah or um, uh, Ezekiel, uh, Daniel, and many of the others? Comment coming in by uh, webcam? One of the prophet jobs of his message that Jeremiah gave was one of rebuke. It was one of uh, not pleasing to the people, and it was a message of warning. So he wasn't speaking smooth words. He was speaking hard-to-handle words. And that was like what the other prophets, too, like Isaiah and John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, John the Baptist was somebody who uh, made uh, the royal uh, the royal figures so angry that uh, they wanted him beheaded. So uh, it just shows you that when you're telling people what they're doing wrong, chances are the message is not really going to be received too well. Uh, but yet, they're called to preach this anyway, and God says, be not afraid of their faces. Um, <clears throat> I, want to, I want us to take a look at a couple of texts here uh, that kind of, I think, make this point even clearer. We're going to go to uh, Isaiah chapter... 1 and verse 19 first. So Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 19. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Okay, now we're going to Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse uh, 5 to 7, which says, For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if he thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if he oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, the, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers, forever and ever. Okay. Next, we're going to go to uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse uh, 23. So Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 23, which says... Have I any pleasure at all in the that the wicked should die, saith the Lord, the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? And now finally, let's go to Matthew chapter 3 and verse uh, 7 to 11. But when, the, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, this is um, uh, John, uh, talking about John the Baptist, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to, ra to sorry, that, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So one of the common themes, it seems, uh, that we're seeing over and over again as we look at prophetic messages is this warning of repentance. So prophets often call people to repent uh, because they have transgressed the covenant. They've broken God's law. They have sinned. And so now God calls them to repentance and to obey him uh, because God has no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, but wants everyone uh, to repent and be, and be saved. This kind of reminds me of another passage. Uh, Surely the Lord God does nothing lest he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. So um, this kind of shows us that God doesn't just want people to be punished because every time they do something wrong, but he sends prophets as warning messengers. Uh, in fact, when you look at uh, Ezekiel, he, he, he calls Ezekiel the watchman, um, and he set uh, Ezekiel up in this position because he wants the wicked to be warned so that, they could, so that they would turn from their iniquity and so that they would do what is right. So that's a, a common theme that we find throughout scripture in regard to the job of a, of a prophet. Um, and the main point I think here is that there are consequences for disobedience and for choosing to go against what God commands. Um, and people have to see their sin for what it really is. So a prophet's job is kind of twofold. First, they call sin by its right name and they reveal the consequences uh, for doing what's wrong. Because unless people see their sin for what it really is, they can't really repent and do what's right. So this is basically the job and the lot uh, of a prophet. They told the truth. And, of course, sometimes the truth is not always readily accepted. People don't always want the truth. Um, we're a society that really pretty much pays for falsehood. We like to be lied to. But the prophets uh, did not give messages 
that were lies. They, they spoke the truth so that people uh, could have a real savior and repent and be forgiven and be in good standing with God. Uh, let's talk about Jeremiah's family background. Uh, if you look at uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 1 and then again in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2 verse 26, this, inter this interesting story of Abiathar pops up. Now, if you know anything about um, David's reign, uh, when David's reign was starting to come to an end, uh, he was very sickly. And um, he had uh, multiple children, some by different wives. And because of this, uh, there were some, everybody was pretty much vying for power and seeking uh, to take the throne in succession to David. Um, but David had chosen Solomon and promised Bathsheba that Solomon would reign in his stead. But yet we find that Adonijah um, decides that he wants to be the one to reign. And so he basically has himself anointed king. Um, he uh, gets a lot of the military involved. Um, he has uh, conspired with Joab and, and a few others, and with um, particularly with Abiathar, uh, the priest, to set himself up as the king. And David, uh, once he found out about this uh, rebellion, even though he was very sickly, did not take too kind to it. Um, uh, Nathan the prophet uh, stepped in and uh, took counsel with uh, Bathsheba, and uh, they came up with this plan in which uh, Solomon would be anointed, would ride on the king's horse, would um, be placed on his throne and would rightfully claim uh, his position as king in the place of his father. And, and, and uh, David himself even, even stated that Solomon would be king in his place. And then we find that Abiathar um, was eventually exiled and sent to live in uh, a new place called Anatha. And... Even though he was exiled there, we find years later that Jeremiah seems to come from a lineage of priests that are from this particular location. So Jeremiah comes from a lineage of priests, um, the origin of which were, you know, were people who were exiled because of this rebellion against Solomon's reign, trying to set up uh, Adonijah as king in the place of Solomon. So Jeremiah, Jeremiah comes from this lineage of priests, and he... Um, is called to be a prophet of God. Next thing I want to do, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 5 to look at the actual calling of Jeremiah and what God had said. We covered it a little bit, but I want to go back uh, through it in more detail. So we're going to Jeremiah chapter 1, and it says, The words of Jeremiah the son of Hil uh, Hilkiah, the priests that were in Anath uh, Anatha in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of, jo uh, of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou, hast, thou camest forth out of, the, out, of the, out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordain thee a prophet unto the nation. So here God makes clear to Jeremiah that his calling was something that God had chosen long before he was even born. God purposed him uh, to do this mission. So this was before Jeremiah could earn the right to become a prophet. This was before Jeremiah could do anything, could, could have any background or could have any um, say or input in becoming a prophet, God had ordained him and, 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 and called him and qualified him before he was even born. So the prophetic ministry really has nothing to do with human beings making themselves qualified, but rather it's God who chooses and makes one qualified. Comment coming in by uh, webcam, so I'll go ahead and take that. All the true prophets pointed to Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's right. So uh, the prophets... Uh, in talking about uh, the covenant, um, also foretold of Jesus' coming because he was the one who would um, bring righteousness and manifest righteousness within the human heart. Jesus accomplished what the law could not do because the law was external from the person. Uh, it could show you what sin is, but it didn't give you the ability to keep the law. So the law externally only gives knowledge of what sin is and tells you not to do it. But Jesus transforms the heart. And so what Jesus accomplished was a way to put righteousness into the person. 
um, and sanctify them so that they could be all that God designed them to be. So going back to our, our text here in, uh, in, in Jeremiah, we see that God calls him before he's even born, before he's, before he's even come out of his mother's womb, he is called to the prophetic ministry. And God has purposed him for this task. And of course, he responds by saying, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm only a child. I don't, know if I, I don't know if I'm right for this job. I don't know if I can do this. Uh, but God, recognizing his fear, says, you know, don't be afraid of their faces because I'm with you to deliver you. But this isn't the first time we've seen somebody kind of shy away from doing the work that God has called the person to. If we take a look, for example, at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, we see Isaiah's response to his prophetic calling. So Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, and it says, <clears throat> Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. So here we see that Isaiah was very fearful. He didn't think he was worthy to preach God's message at all. He's like, you know, I'm undone. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person of unclean lips. I'm a sinner just like everybody else. I can't do this. But then in verse 6, the Bible says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off, from off the altar. And he laid it on my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So we see here that uh, even though the sinner is not qualified for the prophetic ministry, God qualifies the individual for, the, for, for his mission. So the, the, the efficiency of this, or the... the um, I should say the, the sufficiency for the prophetic ministry is not found within humanity, but is really found within God. It's God who makes us sufficient to be able to do what he calls us to do. So we see here a, a, a similarity between Isaiah and Jeremiah. When Jeremiah felt unworthy, God put his hand forth and touched Jeremiah's lips and said, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And here we see that in, uh, the seraphim, the angel, uh, takes a... A live coal from the altar and touches Isaiah's lips with it and says, your iniquity is purged. And now Isaiah was ready to go forward and to proclaim God's word. Uh, we're going to also go to Exodus chapter 4 and look at Moses, who's one of the most famous and, um, uh, uh, sorry, who's one of the most famous of the, of the prophets. Let's see how he responded to God's message. Uh, Exodus chapter 4 verse 10 tells us, and Moses said, Unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the, or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. So the common theme that we see here is that everybody who's ever called to ministry seems to be fearful that they're not going to do a good enough job. They're fearful that they're too sinful, they don't deserve the right to do this, they're children, they can't uh, go forward with this, uh, they're afraid of those who would be against their ministry, but God says to them, hey, I made man's mouth. I've purged you of your iniquity. I have put my words in your mouth. Now you're going to go to all who I send you to. And there's a connection to that uh, in today's time when you think about people who always say, oh, you know, I don't think I'm qualified to do anything in the church. I don't think I'm qualified to do any type of ministry. I don't know if I could ever be the type of person to go out and to give people Bible studies or to go out and to preach God's <clears throat> word from the pulpit. You know, I don't know if any of that could ever be done by me. So many people shy away from doing things in the church because they feel unworthy and unqualified. But God qualifies those who he calls to service. And so if God is calling you, then we should, not sh we should not shy away or think that we're too inadequate to be able to do what God calls us to. Because how can a person say to God, I don't, I'm not eloquent in speech, when it's God who made speech and who made the mouth that, 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 that does speech? So if God is the creator and, he's, and he knows all things and has created all things and knows how all things function, then who are we to tell God that we can't do something that he is enabling us to do? So in the act of calling us to do something, God um, basically qualifies us to do that. So God can't, God's not going to call you to something that he's not going to qualify you to do. And as creator and Lord, he has the power to qualify us and to give us the ability to do anything that he calls us to. So whereas Jeremiah said, Lord, I can't speak. I'm but a child. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think I can do this. God says, I put my words 
and your mouth. When Isaiah was fearful of his sin, God purged his iniquity. When Moses said, I'm not eloquent in speech, God said, I, I made man's mouth. I'm going to send you uh, to, to go to all whom I send you to. So today, we should not be reluctant when God calls us to something because God will qualify us and will give us the ability and will be with us to do everything that he calls us to do. Um, I'm going back to the book of Jeremiah just for a moment. Particularly looking at, uh, I believe it was in chapter 1. And we're going to look at God's response again. Uh, verse 9, Then the Lord put, his, put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See that I have this day set thee over nations and over kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Moreover, the, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? Actually, no, before I go to that part of the, of the verse, there's another part that I wanted to read to you. Uh, verse 8, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So that, that there is God's promise that if he calls us to do something, uh, he's going to be with us to deliver us so that we can accomplish it. So the next part that I want to go into is uh, the verse that I didn't read before, which deals with um, God qualifying uh, and, and um, sorry, God actually giving Jeremiah his first message and his first vision. Um, so if we look back at that verse that I was reading before, uh, verse 13, it says, and the word of the Lord came unto, uh, came unto me the second time saying, what seest thou? And I said, I see, I see a seething pot and the face of the, and the face thereof is toward the North. Then the Lord said unto me out of the North an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the North, saith the Lord, and they shall come and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who, uh, who have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, and worship the works of their own hands. Thou therefore gird up thy loins, and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee. But be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee, before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and, a, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. So here in these words, we see that God already forewarned Jeremiah that in preaching this message, People are going to reject him. And what's fascinating is who he's sending Jeremiah to. He's not sending Jeremiah just to common people. He's not sending Jeremiah to his friends and to his family. He's sending Jeremiah to important people. Imagine being given a, an unpopular message from God that you must deliver to the House of Congress or that you must deliver to the president or that you have to deliver to some king of some foreign nation. Um, I mean, in this country, things are a little bit easier in the sense that you have uh, freedom of speech, and you can criticize a public official without um, necessarily f uh, uh, suffering um, any type of, you know, what's the word I want to use here? Uh, any type of uh, punitive punishment for it. Um, in general, you can criticize just about anybody. But in, in, in Jeremiah's time, when you criticize the king and you gave him an unpopular uh, message, they had what would what would be comparable to an um, uh, to a absolute monarchy, where the king had power and could easily have you killed, put in prison, beaten, scourged, or whatever he wanted to do. So when you look at a context like that, and having to go and preach an unpopular message to a person who could easily take away your life, you could see how Jeremiah would be fearful, but yet God was sending him to do just that. Um, and he says that he's going to defend Jeremiah because when they reject him, uh, though they might try uh, to take him out, God was going to be with him 
to deliver him. So today that kind of connects to us in that God might send us to important people, to uh, political figures, to people with a lot of power and, and influence. But even though they might have a lot of power and influence, God is able to deliver us and to prevent them uh, from being able to do us in. And so that's what he promises to do here for, for Jeremiah. So Jeremiah was going with an unpopular message to very important people. And I think that verse 17 is worth mentioning here because it says, Thou therefore girdest up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. So here God gives the message that if he doesn't go and give this message because he's afraid of the people, uh, there's something much worse that he should be afraid of in, in that he should be afraid of God before being afraid of man. So the message here is that people should fear God rather than man. Even though people can do terrible things to you, uh, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God. I want to grab another text for you. Okay. <clears throat> Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. It took me a minute to find it. I was trying to remember uh, the, uh, the story. Um, Peter and the apostles were told by the rabbis and the political figures and the, and the priests and so forth that they were not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And there's an interesting response that Peter has um, that I think kind of relates to what we've been talking about. Uh, he says in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. So this, I think, is a popular theme in, in Scripture where when people tell you one thing and God is telling you another thing, you know, sometimes the two ideas conflict. And we saw that with, uh, with Daniel uh, and the situation with the lion's den, where the king was tricked into making a, uh, a rule which said that you could not worship any other god, you couldn't pray to any other god but the king. And Daniel, who was accustomed to praying three times a day, went before an open window and openly prayed so that these men could catch him and have him thrown into the den of lions. And of course, we know the story that God shut the lion's mouths and that God was with him to deliver him and sent his angel to, to close the mouths of the lions. And then ultimately, those who had tricked the king into making this, this law were thrown into the den of lions and killed. So there are always going to be these tests in life in which you have to choose between obeying God versus obeying people. There's, the devil is always going to make those kind of conflicts of interest to tempt people to fear people other people, other human beings, instead of fearing God. We saw that with the situation with the three Hebrew boys, where the king said, bow down before the statue. And they said, no. And if, and if, you, if uh, you throw us into the fiery furnace, our God is able to deliver us. And we know that once they were thrown in, the furnace was so hot that it killed the people who were throwing them in. But yet, they didn't even walk out of there with so much as the smell of smoke. They, they were delivered. God was with them and had delivered them in the midst of the fiery furnace. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked in, uh, expecting to see three Hebrews uh, burning, he saw four people in there, and the fourth one looked like the Son of God. And so we find that when we're put into situations where the state or the government or uh, important officials or those who are in authority, friends or family or whoever it might be, are telling us to do one thing and God is telling us to do something else, uh, we should always obey God rather than man. Um, there's one more text I want to bring you to. But uh, the text that I was thinking of was, uh, Fear not them which have power to kill the body and not the soul. Um, so Jesus here draws a distinction between a lot of times when you stand up for truth and you, and you try to preach the word of God, uh, they're going to be those who seek to kill you and who seek to discourage you from, uh, you know, from preaching God's word. But instead of being afraid of them, God tells us here that we shouldn't fear people who have power to kill only the body, but they don't have any power over what happens after that. God, on the other hand, has not only power to kill our physical bodies, but he also has power not to allow us into everlasting life. And so we know that at the end, at the end of time, there is an executive phase of the judgment in which God uh, will cast all things that are, uh, that are sinful and wicked and abominations into the lake of fire. Uh, and so um, God has the power uh, to kill both the body and the soul, the soul being the entire person. Okay, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. 
And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And when it talks about um, hell here, it's not talking about uh, a place where you burn forever and ever and ever, like as is taught by uh, uh, Greek mythology, but it's talking about Gehenna, the place of burning. And so uh, the place of, of, of burning is the lake of fire uh, that exists, that you read about in Revelation chapter uh, 20, I believe, uh, where the wicked are, uh, and death in the grave are eventually thrown in, and where the devil himself will eventually uh, be destroyed. So... In the first part of Jeremiah's vision, he sees this almond branch, and um, he, this almond branch. Uh, let me let me go back to the text. It's Jeremiah chapter one, where uh, and starting at verse thirteen, where he where he sees this vision of the uh, of the almond branch, and it says here, "The word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou?'" And I said, "I see a seething pot." I'm sorry, wrong, wrong one. I meant to say uh, verse eleven. Um, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Uh, in some translations that said uh, perform it is actually uh, to, uh, to watch. Um, <clears throat> so here, uh, or, to, or to keep watch, rather. Uh, so here, when Jeremiah sees this almond tree in the, in the Hebrew um, the word that's used there is very similar to the word that's used in Hebrew for keep watch. Um, so when you look at uh, this vision of the almond tree, it's kind of a play on words that we don't really see in the, in the English translation, uh, but would have come out in the Hebrew translation. So um, he shows Jeremiah this almond tree um, that was a play on words with the word wa uh, watch, because the root word that was used for almond tree um, was the same one that was used for watch, and it's the same word that's used in the next verse, which um, where God says, um, "I will hasten my word to to keep watch or to keep watch for my word." So the play on words here is that God is going to keep watch to perform that which He seeks to do. So the word translated almond tree uh, has the same root as the verb to keep watch, which appears in verse twelve. And the Lord says that he's going to keep watch over his word to fulfill it. That's the important part here. So I think one of the things that we can learn from this is that when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He's going to perform it. So the prophet can be sure that if God, is, if, if God has given him a message, if God has given him uh, something to proclaim, that God is going to perform that which he proclaims. And the prophet must go to all whom God sends him to, to give them this warning. Because even though God doesn't, have any pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, once wickedness reach, reaches a certain point, God is going to respond to it. But through the warning message of the prophet, like Jeremiah, uh, God is giving people an opportunity to repent. So it's an unpopular message, but yet it's a necessary message, and it's a message of hope and mercy. Because even though he's proclaiming judgment, he's warning you ahead of time before it even happens, giving you the opportunity to avoid it. So... The purpose of the, the prophet, say a lot of people read the prophetic messages like Jeremiah and many of the others, uh, and they say, oh, it's doom and gloom. God is going to destroy this person because they're bad, and God is always seeking to punish. But what they're not realizing is what's behind the warning message. The prophet is not given the warning message of, of, of doom and gloom so as to make people depressed and get them to just give up on life and be sad that they're about to be destroyed. The purpose of the warning message is so that they can avoid the calamity. And that's the part of prophecy that most people miss. Prophecy is not about depressing people. Prophe prophecy is about warning people so that they could avoid the calamity. So he's warning you ahead of time so that you have more than enough ample time to repent and escape the judgment. The same thing can be said about all the, about all the warning messages of the Bible. God is giving this world an opportunity to repent and to escape the judgment. But yet, so many people would rather reject the message of the prophets, just like they rejected Jeremiah, just like they rejected Jesus, and live how they want to live and suffer the fate of these calamities uh, when it's too late to turn and to repent. There's so much more that we can talk about in regard to Jeremiah and his calling, but we are out of time for tonight. So let's just close with a word, with a word, with a word of prayer that God will open up our hearts that when his messengers speak, 
we will receive the message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the warning messages that you have sent through your servants, the prophets. Help us, Lord, to be obedient and to repent so that we can escape the judgment and so that we can escape uh, the things that are going to come upon this world due to the disobedience and the transgression of your law. Help us, Lord, to live for you and help us, Father, to heed these warnings that we may be saved and that we may be united with you and turn from our ungodliness. Help us, Father, where we fall short and help us to be receptive to hearing the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Good night.